That's Amy. <laughs> Hi. Hello. It's a thrill for me to meet her. I was trying to, uh, to not blow anything backstage, but I watched you so much on television. It was like a lot. <laughs> a lot. Yeah. 40 games. Yeah. And then how many in the, in the, in the championship? Uh, yeah, it was like, I guess, uh, seven more in the, the Tournament of Champions. Oh and then, uh, yeah. That's a lot of questions. It's a lot of questions. <laughs> That's a lot of questions. So I'm sure you have your questions. I have mine. But I'm just... <laughs> You know, you get excited. You meet, you meet your heroes, you get excited. So, I'm sure all of these people are here because they are wondering um, what it's like to be a software engineer. <laughs> yeah, that was one of the questions from your publisher or your agents. So, anyway, Jeopardy, a huge part of your life, before we get to your life, oh, yeah. a huge part of your life, all from childhood still. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I can't remember a time when I wasn't watching Jeopardy. It was, you know, it was just on every, every night in my house growing up, so yeah. And then, uh, you know, famously, I was voted in eighth grade most likely to appear on Jeopardy one day. And so, you know, you got to hand it to the eighth graders of Corpus Christi uh, Parish School. They, they really knew what they were talking about. They, they obviously did, and why, but why would they have known that? What? Uh, because I got the best grades on all the tests, basically, but, you know, <laughs> which, you know, I mean, it was a good sign. I, I, the, I was just born with a, like, pretty good memory, um, and so, like, that is certainly gave me an advantage, but, you know, I mean, I do think there was a lot more to it than that, but that is the part that I was just fortunate for. Well, we were talking a little bit about this backstage, that it is, there is, of course, the memory is a, is a huge part of it, but it's also breaking down words. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, the best way to study before Jeopardy is watching Jeopardy and, like, studying their clues, because they have a certain style, and they haven't, you know, like, the example I always give is that if they say Jewish painter in a clue, it's always Marc Chagall. You don't even have to read the rest of the clue. Um, and so, like, little things like that can, can really help you. Because it's not just that you have to know the answers. You have to know it right away. It goes a lot faster than it seems to on TV when you're up there. So do you hit the button before you know the answer? <laughs> I mean, that is the... It is a difficult, like... You know, it's a thing you have to figure out in the moment. Like, sometimes you will, like, sometimes it'll be like, I don't know this yet, but I, I can come up with it in the five seconds that they give you. And sometimes you're right, and sometimes you're wrong. And it's, you know, yeah. Because it does seem sometimes I've seen people buzz in and then go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think a lot of times what that'll be is, like, you'll ring in b because you've, like, think you've got the answer and then you'll like notice that like it doesn't fit the category or something <laughs> and then you're like oh well if it wasn't my guest then I you know I got nothing and now I look like an idiot yeah <laughs> so uh, what what is the secret to buzzing do, uh, do you have a hand, did you have a hand position that you <laughs> I mean I didn't you know I kept the, the only thing about my hand position was that I kept it below the podium because I know watching the show my whole life, I always found it kind of off-putting when you'd see people like frantically <laughs> doing that. But the thing is, I was doing that too. Every contestant does, you kind of have to. I just kept it down here so I looked cool. And that you did. I do, it does sort of disturb me when you see the, the two-handed ones. Mm -hmm. And I always wonder, do you think it works better with two hands? You, <laughs> but, I, I, but it doesn't. I, I don't think so. I mean, I think that they, there, there are people who have studied this in alarming detail that have some theories about it, but I, I haven't gotten that in-depth into buzzer strategy. So do you think that there's a difference at which podium you're placed? I don't think so. I mean, I was at the same podium for the 39 of the 40 games, so... <laughs> And that's why they're here instead of watching Martha. <laughs> so, she was in prison most of that time. Just, I love Martha. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. We love Martha. So, so you know you have this great memory and you know you have this way of, of breaking things down. Mm -hmm. How does that, so that, and that serves you in school, it mm -hmm. serves you all through school. What about a career? Well, I mean, I think that uh, 
you know, I mean, one of the things about that serving me through school, you know, I did good at, on standardized tests. Um, once you graduate from school, that's not a very useful skill to have anymore. Um, you know, when it came to my career, I was, you know, had I, had I uh, not had parents who cared about my future, I would have perhaps gone into like acting or writing or something like that. But they were made it very clear that they were not going to allow that to happen. Um, and so ultimately I went into computer programming because it was still, there is still an element of creativity to it. You know, you are, you are starting with a, a blank screen and creating something every day. And that was something that I really felt I needed in a job. And, you know, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, you know, I, I did it for about 20 years and I enjoyed it for about 17 of them. Um, and so by the time I was on Jeopardy, I was really like kind of like done with it. I no longer cared about computers and so I was kind of looking for something new to do and then uh, this happened, so yeah. But, but theater was something that definitely was in your heart. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, ever since I, ever since I did, ever since my cousin was doing a production of The Music Man, they didn't have enough Towns kids and I got drafted in and, and I loved it. And so it's, yeah, it's uh, definitely been a big part of my life. So, the, the very last quote that I pulled here, um, which is, I showed Amy, is, is like marked in purple because it's, I was, it was, oh, it was late. Um, <laughs> when I was cast as Algernon, a couple of years later, there was basically a flashing neon sign saying, Amy is a woman, that I'm shocked I didn't see. <laughs> Thanks to my This Is Theater epiphany a few years earlier, I didn't bother, it didn't bother me that Algernon was by critical consensus. Doesn't help when you're dyslexic and you stick a sticker in your way. Uh, the gayest gay who ever gay. <laughs> because wherever the deal with gay people was, they were at least allowed to be in theatrical productions. <laughs> Even my parents couldn't deny that. As Catholic as they were, they were also intellectuals. And the idea that Algernon wasn't intended to be understood as a melodramatic swishy fag could only be maintained by the sort of people who didn't listen to NPR. <laughs> and my parents were not going to lower themselves to that level. <laughs> It's fabulous. I, 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 I'm not only a fan of her uh, uh, abilities, but of her writing. Oh, thank um, you. Uh, if you haven't read the book, how many people have read the book so far? It's, it's, oh, it just came out. <laughs> yeah, it's been it's been a day. <laughs> so you haven't seen the movie either. <laughs> Benedict Cumberbatch is so good in some. Of those um. So yes, the book yes. just came out. It's it's and it, it, it's one well, no, So get out there, buy several copies for friends. <laughs> We're not that far from Christmas, <laughs> and she'll sign them. Okay. I, I will. I I, I want I want them to give me another book deal. So yeah, please buy as many as you want. That, that'd be great. Okay, I've got. Um, well, would you read something to us? Or do you not want to? I, I mean, I'd be, to. I'd be happy to. I did the whole audio book, so it's like, I guess I'm fine with it. <laughs> I bet you it didn't take you very long either. Uh, they, they reserved 15 hours of studio time. I was out in 11, just, just saying. They reserved 15 days for me, and I was out in three weeks. <laughs> As I said, I'm dyslexic. <laughs> and Charlie got bored. <laughs> Okay, so before, before I give you this to read, something to read, um, I, I just wanted uh, uh, to read this quote of, from your publisher. Uh, what are you talking about, your publisher? So, you want me to write down all the stuff I think about myself? <laughs> to actually out the arguments I've been crafting in my head for an imaginary audience every night for basically in my entire life. Here they are. <laughs> so, yes. what, what, what would you, would, is there something you'd like to read to us? Oh, I, 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 I thought you had something ready to go. I no, wasn't, no. yeah. I, I could. <laughs> um, No, yeah. That's too boring. That's, too, that, that's something I would read to you. That's something I would read to you. Um, yeah. He's, just, he's uh, just kidding. None of it's boring. None of it's boring. No, no, no. I meant, I meant, 
I bet it wouldn't it wouldn't elicit tears or anything from her, and I want her broken. Um, okay, how does fame feel? Yeah. So the 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 chapter, what's it like to be famous? Uh, how does fame feel? It feels great. <laughs> I was flown out to DC, my first experience as celebrity treatment. Genevieve and I were slack-jawed the whole weekend at how amazing everything was. They flew us first class with those sleep pods that you can lie down in. They put us up in a swanky hotel in a suite the size of our apartment with floor-to-ceiling windows in the bedroom and drapes that you could control with a switch from your bed. And, uh, you know, Genevieve's aunt who lived in DC texted her something along the lines of, oh, well, that neighborhood isn't the real DC. And we just laughed. Of course it wasn't. It wasn't the real anything. It was rich people town, a place we never thought we'd be invited to. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I got okay. applause. Let's, let's get out on that. She's television. <laughs> She's going to have her. They're going to come up with a game show for her. I, <laughs> I just know that. It's going to be game show heaven here. Okay. So, here you are, a, a, a child. Sure. <laughs> Looking for your... I, my theory is that most people who don't end up... Um, <laughs> accept the world as it is. Mm. And then there's us. <laughs> the yeah. ones who go through their childhood and look around and see the role they're supposed to play mm -hmm. and it doesn't quite work. So they go back. I, I, I always say a, a gay kids have done a therapy more than, than a lifetime of therapy just because yeah. we, we keep having to come up with answers. So here you are feeling feelings that these very wonderful parents of yours couldn't possibly imagine your feeling. For sure. And I mean, you know, it was not their fault particularly. It was, you know, it was the 80s, it was Ohio. Like, nobody knew that trans people existed, essentially, in, in their community. Um, and so, so it wasn't something that was, I couldn't know that I was trans because of that. You know, it wasn't a, a mental concept in my world. Um, and so, you know, I, it, it was something that caused me to be questioning things from the beginning because everybody was telling me that, like, not only was I not allowed to do things like, I don't know, read American Girl doll books I mentioned in the book or, um, you know, like, you know, have a different type of haircut or wear different types of clothes, but it was made clear to me that I should have known that already and it should be obvious to me that I couldn't do those things and that I shouldn't even want to. And so I was, it sort of made me sort of, I found the rules of the world inexplicable and so I was always trying to like figure out what was going on and what was behind everything everybody was saying, I think because of that. But, but was there a difference of feeling, since you're not gay, of saying, well, if I was gay, I'd be feeling this, or, mm -hmm. I mean... Well, yeah, I mean, that, that, you know, that was a thing that, you know, gay people, you know, that was a concept I knew about, and gay men were effeminate and seemed to get to do some of the things I wanted to do. Um, the issue was that they were also attracted to men, and I was not, and I tried. I uh, really attempted to like uh, fantasize about like Leonardo DiCaprio at one point in high school, um, like Romeo and Plus Juliet. So like you know, not that manly, uh, but I, st I, I still couldn't do it. And so I was like, well, I'm not gay. I'm I'm out of ideas. I don't know. Right. So, the, the, because the big question is the separation between sexuality and gender. Right. That's a huge question that most adults now mm -hmm. can't answer. Yeah. Congress certainly can't. <laughs> For sure. And I mean, I think that that's, you know, the biggest, I think, you know, sort of myth that was out there about trans people and is, is only slowly fading is that, is that being trans has anything to do with sex at all. Like, it doesn't. I mean, you know, to some extent, you know, sexuality is tied up in everything in our lives. Like, there's some type of correlation. But, you know, being trans has nothing to do with who you want to have sex with, whether you want to have sex at all. It's not a, a kink or a fetish. It's about how you want to live your life. You know, and it's, I think that, like, 
for a long time I had it confused with being a drag queen, uh, which also wasn't necessarily about sex, but is about this very stylized thing. And I realized, you know, that actually being trans isn't about that. Like, I, I like dressing up nice, but I also just like, you know, like being around and just like, you know, yoga pants and like flip flops or whatever, just living my life. I gotta go find that quote. <laughs> I gotta find that quote because it's so good. Um, you know, that's the one about, you know, we'll get to that. It's over here. It's over here. I swear I've done this before. <laughs> okay. And the whole trans issue is just not that hard. All you have to do is believe me. Take me at my word when I tell you that I'm a woman. After that, the solution to all those controversies out there will seem trivial. Should I be allowed in a women's bathroom? Well, duh, I'm a woman. And it's not hard to believe me either. Did you see me on TV? What did you see? If you saw anything other than a woman, then I have to tell you, you're in a small minority. There are so many grandpas from middle America that without even trying accepted me as a woman and gendered me correctly. It's only difficult if you decide to be difficult about it. I'm skipping a paragraph, but you better not when you read this. <laughs> First, if men wanted to dress up like women and sneak into women's bathrooms, can't they do that anyway? Couldn't they always do that? What do trans people have to do with this? Why drag us into this? I just, I, uh, I can't tell you. <laughs> Cindy Lauper and I made a whole video with the cast of, of Kinky Boots. We have a song in Kinky Boots called Just B, but we changed it to Just P. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and then um, I, I took, I was, in a, I was in JFK, and I went into the men's room. And Senator Lieberman came in after me. It's on the internet. <laughs> and someone took a photograph of the two of us peeing next to each other, talking, <laughs> discussing something. And then we put it up with the Cindy Lauper in my video of just pee. Wow. Pee where you want to pee. It's, <laughs> but it is, it's not that, I mean, what do they expect? What? I'm from the theater. In the theater, the women's line is usually very long. Yeah. And when the curtain has to go up, women go into the men's room. It's just what we do. Yeah. It's, it's polite, it's nobody standing there waving their pee-pees at each other. <laughs> they need to pee. <laughs> yeah. Why, why? I mean, why? It's, it is baffling to me, especially since, again, in the women's room, you know you go in the stall, right? Like nobody, you're just as covered and in a women's room as you are anywhere else in the world. That we, We've got privacy there, it's okay. You don't have to see anything, but yeah. And in the men's room, unless you're really, you know, <laughs> this separation. Yeah, I mean. If you want it. <laughs> There's more, more flexibility uh, there around my, that. Yeah. This is my childhood coming back to me. Um, <laughs> Just a little flashback to the 80s. Well, she was talking about the 80s. I could do it, too. <laughs> so, we have here... Oh, no, no we're not going to go to that yet. That's just, that's just the, the wherewithal. Um, so let's get back to when you finally decided mm -hmm. that this was the answer for you. Yeah. How old, actually? Uh, so, I mean, it was a you know, sort of process that went over like seven or eight years, that, but it ended, you know, I finally, finally came out when I was 26, 37, yeah. So it's, you know, it, and it, 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 that's definitely a thing that I struggled to deal with, you know, you know, partly just because it was like, should I really, should I have known before now, and, and I talk a lot about sort of processing through that in the book, but also, you know, it was so amazing and so wonderful uh, when I came out and, and improved my life so much more than I even expected it to, 
that it was really, you know, I really had to struggle with the, the grief over all the years that, that I'd lost, you know, that I'd been living in this, you know, pain that I didn't know about because I'd never lived without it. Um, and, you know, that was, that was something I had to, to kind of work through. Um, but really, it, actually, but one of the key moments in that was I, I read an article in the New York Times or somewhere about a World War II veteran who had just come out as a trans woman at the age of like 93. And it was a beautiful story and it was also like, well, you know, like, I, that could have been me. I, well, let's, let's be happy for the years I get and not, not worry about the ones I didn't. And the, and the physicalization, um, were you, I mean, because of the theatricality and all that, were you already playing with a little bit of makeup? Were you playing? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, spent a while kind of just conceiving of myself as a cross-dresser um, because, again, some of these myths about, like, I felt like it was too late for me to be trans, so I guess I just enjoyed cross-dressing. So, yeah, I mean, I did, you know, like, you know, have, like, stashes of clothes and, and I played with makeup and things like that. Um, I mean, it's funny, too, like, I had always um, had kind of a, you know, I, I'd always kind of had, some, like, hand gestures, like, there had always been, like, parts of my body language that were, that read real feminine, and, like, people would comment on it sometimes, and, you know, I, I got asked if I was gay, like, a lot in my life, and I kept having a problem, no, I'm really not, I promise, um, and then, yeah, it, it ultimately turned out that I was actually a woman, which is why I was acting so effeminate, it made sense. You, this section there. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I, yeah. I recognize it. I wrote it. Um, and well. Yeah. So it's, it's talking about, um, you know, I, 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 a lot of anxiety I had early in transition of, you know, kind of entering these, these single sex spaces. Um, in this case, talking about, you know, I joined a gym and I would, you know, my experiences in the women's locker room. Um, it says, I never got fully naked where anyone could see me, or even slightly naked. The showers had little changing rooms attached with a bench and hooks and so on. So I would get fully dressed in there after my shower, even though I wasn't fully dry, and all my clothes would cling weirdly to me in the steam. But I didn't want anyone to see my penis, because that seemed to me something somebody could le legitimately be upset by without necessarily being transphobic. Also, I just didn't want anyone to see my penis. I was not a fan of it. Um, so I got in and out of there as fast as I could. Yes, there were naked women in there, and yes, they came into my field of vision sometimes, and yes, I often found them quite attractive. How could I not? But I stayed nonchalant and kept tight control of my gaze at all times. Um, yeah, so that's, that was sort of like that early experience of being so afraid of being the negative thing that being the thing that people were frightened of was was something I was really really worried about early on there. Yeah. That's that's what I was feeling when I read that. I just yeah. felt like it's hard enough to have to deal with your own feelings, mm -hmm. but then to worry about what the world is thinking of you mm -hmm. and what other people around you are thinking of you and have to judge that constantly. Yeah, and it's you know that that is the being trans specifically is like it's it's whenever you're out you know out, out out walk out your door like it's never hidden like anybody can see it all the time every every person you encounter if if they you know care to pay close attention can figure it out um i mean especially earlier in transition before hormones have kicked in and stuff like that and so you know and and it is something that a great number of people feel is perfectly fair for them to comment on unsolicited and so you just, you, it took a while to get used to the fact that that was something that might happen kind of at any time and kind of would be for the rest of my life, and which isn't great, but you know, it hasn't, I, it is very rarely happens anything like that negative, but it's always a possibility. And that's, I don't know, that sucks, that's all. There's a moment in the book where, where you say, um, that some friends said, come on, let's go. And you said, wait, I have to get my makeup on. And she said, would you look in the mirror? Just look in the mirror. What do you, you don't have to get your makeup. We see a woman. Yeah. There is a woman there. And, and you sort of had to realize. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was one of the you know, most uh, wonderful things that a friend did for me in that time. Um, you know, it was true. And, you know, I, so 
Uh, ever since then, I like kind of stopped doing my makeup, and I got completely out of practice. Now it's really hard. I've really gotten good at it at that point, and then I was like, oh, do I not have to? Then screw this. I'm, <laughs> I'm done with that. Um, but it was, you know, it was, it was a real, real journey to be able to see, look in the mirror and see a woman looking back at me and not see a man in a dress that was, you know, pretending that everybody was like, you know, seeing through. Um, and that was, that was kind of the first moment when I did. And it was, it was really wonderful. And you can see your heart right through it too. Yeah. So don't even worry about that. <laughs> so talk to me about deciding you are going to do Jeopardy. So here you are, you're going to audition for Jeopardy, mm -hmm. a, a trans woman. Mm -hmm. And we hadn't seen that on game shows. <laughs> yeah, not much. There, there had been a couple of trans women uh, competing on Jeopardy before. Um, and so, and, and I had seen that. Um, and you know, and I'd been trying out for years before I transitioned. Um, but then when I transitioned, it was something that I was like, "No, I, I should. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go beyond TV as a trans person. That's, you know, frightening." Um, but then you know, a year or two went by, and I was like, "Wait a minute. This has been a dream, like literally my whole life. Like literally 40 years, I've been dreaming of this." I'm not gonna let people take that away from me. And so I was like, you know, and and I. And thanks to those trans women who went before me, who showed me that it was possible, um, that also gave me a, you know, made it a lot easier for me to do that. So I'm very grateful to them. Um, but yeah, it was still something that, like, as the day was coming, I was like really apprehensive about. I was really, like, it, it really like activated my dysphoria and made me start feeling less and less comfortable with myself. The idea of being on camera, um, and. You know, I the way I got through it was just by classifying it, just focusing on the game, period. And so, like, not thinking about my dysphoria, but also not thinking about anything else, how people would react, you know, how the game was going, like, because there's, you know, don't worry about if I, if I get something wrong, forget it immediately, like, all those sorts of things. Um, so just being so focused, like, was you know, partly a strategy for the game, but also just partly a strategy for me to be able to go on camera and not, like, freak out. So you, so you win three games, which, of course, yeah, in a row, and it's, it's not on television yet or any of right. that. So, so whatever nerves were there, were there because you're playing a game. And if, if I understand correctly, there was no studio audience at that time. That's correct, yeah. But, it was still before... Uh, before they'd let them back during right. COVID, yeah. So you, so you actually got to go there and play Jeopardy mm -hmm. without some reactions. Yeah, which I think was definitely an advantage. I, I think that that, I, you know, it helped me at least. You know, I mean, I have gone, I, since I've gone back and done the tournaments with the audience, like, you know, I don't think it necessarily made a huge difference, but I, I did like not having an audience there, actually, which is rare for me. I generally like having an audience. <laughs> So how long before they aired the first three, and was it before you went back the next time? So I I taped all forty or t forty one games, counting the one I lost before the first one had aired. Oh. Yeah, so it was yeah it, it was a I taped my last one, and it was like a week or two before the first one was set to air. Um, so I I it was it was a weird couple of weeks, you know. And I mean, then even, you know, as the run is going on, you know, I remember the, the first few days, like I had friends who were texting me every night, like, oh, congratulations. And I was like, if you're committing to texting me every night, uh, you know. <laughs> but yeah, but it, 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 you know, and it also, you know, when I, I, that wasn't what I was expecting when I went to, you know, be on the show. I was hoping to win, you know, maybe a few games, like if things went my way, but like, I couldn't have predicted like that level of success. And so it, I knew that it meant that like the level of attention I was getting was going to be much higher than I had counted on going in. Um, you know, like one good thing was that like Jeopardy connected me with Glad and they kind of like helped me, you know, like internet safety best practices and things like that. But it was, it was, that was definitely a, uh, an exciting and scary time because, you know, I've seen what happens to trans people on Twitter sometimes. And like, I thought it was about to happen to me. So um, yeah, that was, it was a very intense time in my life. Okay, but before then, 
What did it feel like to keep winning those games? I mean, come on. What was that like? Oh, that was great. Did you? Sleep? That was fantastic. Could you sleep at night after a game? Did you just go over it? No, I can't imagine. I mean, well, I mean, I did because it is exhausting. It is like an 11-hour day, and, you know, I'm, you know, being so focused, like, during those games, I would just, like, get home and or get to my hotel room afterwards and just, like, crash and, like, not, you know, just like kind of lie in bed like not even thinking just like you know like yeah like I my brain had stopped working it had done all the thinking it was going to do that day um but it was amazing it, you know obviously um you know like I'm I'm making like a year's salary in a week you know that's pretty great um <laughs> but like even beyond that you know there was the feeling of Focusing so intently on something, um, like really shutting everything else out and having that single-minded focus uh, is just a really rewarding feeling. And so like, it's something that I've tried to cultivate more in my life, uh, not very successfully because not everything is the motivation that Jeopardy did, but it's something I try to remember that like stripping away those, those distractions like, and, and taking the time to do that um, leaves you feeling good, and it was that was kind of a a nice little side lesson that I learned from that experience. But you had signed an NDA, right? So you couldn't actually share this with other people, right? You know, they they said that basically anybody that would have been in the studio that I would have invited to the studio audience or that had been allowed that I could tell them. Oh, okay. I told more people than that. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> but like you know, like not not too many people because it is they don't they don't give you the money until after all your episodes have aired, so that if you do break the NDA, they could like take the prize money. Like I don't know that they've ever actually done that, but it was definitely a powerful uh, incentive. They did it to Kevin McCarthy. <laughs> <laughs> oh come on, we had to have one political <laughs> joke. Come on. Have you seen Congress? You have to have one joke about <laughs> those people. Especially the, the readings that they've done lately about our, our people. So, okay. So, then, it's on television. Mm -hmm. What the fuck? <laughs> Did you, like, walk out the next day, like, going... Uh, I oh. mean... <laughs> Yeah, you know, not 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 the first day, but like after a few of that, a few of them that aired, I, I did. You know, after I got recognized the first time, I was in this this parking lot near Fourth uh, Street on Berkeley, uh, and you know, a mother and her daughter recognized me, and I was like, "Oh, that was nice. I like that." <laughs> um, and then you know, and it picked up, and and yeah, I I generally loved it that I get recognized on the street and you know people tell me I'm great. Like it's a pretty enjoyable experience. <laughs> um, you know, it is it is the sort of thing where it's if if on a given day I'm not in the mood, I can't sit, I can't just be like okay nobody recognized me today. You know, so it's it's something that I don't is is somewhat out of my control, but uh, it's also extremely gratifying to my ego. So, well, let me give you a hint. On those days, get one of these. Because <laughs> nobody looks at me, it's great. <laughs> they only look at him, it's great, it's great. <laughs> so, there you are, and now you're being recognized on the street, and it's getting bigger, and it's getting bigger, and it becomes news. I mean, it was actually news. Yeah. No, I mean, that was an experience of, of having my name be in clickbait, clickbait SEO headlines was a strange experience. Like, I would tweet something, and then there would be these headlines popping up that says, Amy Schneider reveals. And I was like, I didn't reveal any. I said something. Like, it's not, it wasn't a revelation. And it was, that, was, that was definitely a, a strange feeling. And it was, it was also something that was, was kind of disturbing, because I, I did post something online about having gotten, you know, held up and gotten my purse stolen. Um, and then all of a sudden, I'm hearing from, like, friends and family who I hadn't told about it, they're like, oh, but what? I just saw the the headline, and I was like, oh right, that's going to be a headline. Like, and if I don't want things to be headline uh, headlines, I have to be really careful about who I say them to. So that was the first sort of realization: is like, oh, it's gonna. I have to be the one to maintain the boundary between my private and public life because you know other people won't. Well, and all of a sudden, 
people have an opinion of who you are. <laughs> yeah. It's not it's no longer who you are, who you want to present yourself as, but they actually get an opinion because you've been on television. It yeah. gives them the right. Yeah, no, I mean for sure. And it's also, you know, a weird thing that, you know, everyone I meet, not everyone, but most of the people I meet know me and I don't know anything about them and that imbalance is like a, a strange one to experience. Um, and it's also, you know, I, I really noticed it even um, the way that people reacted, uh, the, the opinions that people would have about the other contestants that I had played with and they would be like, oh, this person is such and such, they're, they're, they're so like competitive and, and, and annoying, I don't like them. And I was like, I spent all day with that person. They were very nice, you know? They were nothing like that. But like, because you only see this little sliver of a person on TV, you think you know them, um, because that's, that's the Hollywood magic, is it makes you feel like you know them, but you really don't. Well, it's time for you to have your say. <laughs> Um, and what I really love is it says you have 15 minutes left. <laughs> These are questions, you just do the ones you approve of. I don't read that fast. So I'm going to ask whatever comes up here, and, and if you don't want to answer it, say, on to the next one. Hi, Amy. Hi. My name is Ethan, and I'm a trans person. Thank you for your unapologetic visibility. Do you feel pressure to represent all of us? Um, you know... Yes. Um, I think that, you know, that was like a big part of my decision in, in writing this book was I felt that, you know, being, you know, I had put my best foot forward on Jeopardy and was very family friendly and like Jeopardy is such a like normal, popular institution. Um, and it became this weird feeling of like, oh no, I have to maintain this perfect image. Um, so it was, and, and I realized that if that actually not only did I not have to, but I kind of felt an obligation not to maintain that perfect image because then it's just setting a standard for other trans people that, that they can't live up to, that I can't live up to. And so that was why I kind of wanted to put a lot of stuff in this book that went against that image to show people that I am, you know, a complete complex person that has, you know, uh, uh, social, you know socially acceptable sides and more kind of like messy uh, taboo sides or whatever. Um, and that the you know that, that those are all compatible with each other. And and this question sort of goes to that of, of when you're writing your memoir, obviously you're picking and choosing yeah. um, the things. So it's, I recently heard Jeanette McCurdy talk about writing her memoir. I'm glad my mom died. When she, uh, uh, she said when she felt the feeling of not wanting to go there about a topic, she especially went there and wrote about it. Did you have a guiding principle like this when writing your book? Um, yeah, I mean, really, my, the thing about it with me was, like, I almost never felt like I didn't want to go there for whatever reason. I just, like, I've always been kind of a, like, wanting to be an open and transparent person, and so I, I didn't have to really push myself to go anywhere. My, my principle really was, I can be, you know, all exhibitionist and share all my secrets if I want to, but the other people in my life deserve their privacy. Um, and so the only things I was really like trying to be conscious of were, is this my secret to tell or is, is this to somebody else, you know, do I need to, to keep this private on, on behalf of somebody else? I changed names. Oh, I, I changed <laughs> Did some names. Did you change a lot of yeah. names? Yeah, so yeah. Ask. I, I, but I still lost friends. Um, <laughs> and I tried to be as nice as I could. If I told the truth, I would have probably lost more. Um, <laughs> this is from Stephanie. What is, was your favorite Jeopardy category? Um, you know, there were a few, but uh, I think one that I've talked about is the year of before and after, where it's like the, the before and after style clues, clues that they do, but um, one of the halves was a year. And so, like, I remember one of them, I think, was like 1940 winks. It was like 40 winks as a phrase, which I liked because I'm not really actually great. I can remember like when things happen in history, but like nailing down a specific year is not always that easy. But with this, if you got the, the other phrase, then you just had to get the right century for the date. So I, I enjoyed that about it. This one is, of course, um, showbiz. Um, who do you want to play you in the movie? <laughs> uh, I'm available. <laughs> CAA is here. 
Hi, Amy, huge fan. Can you speak to how you studied or prepared for the show? God, I know you did, especially strengthening your weaknesses or gaps. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, and it was actually a tip that I got from the book Prisoner of a Trebekistan uh, by uh, Bob Harris, uh, who was a champion years ago, and he said that uh, one of the things to do on a subject you're not good at is just get the, like, for dummies book out of the library. So like at one point I got like opera for dummies because I don't know a lot about it. Because that's the thing about Jeopardy is it doesn't go that in depth on anything. So if you sort of know like kind of the basics about like the top like 10, 12 operas that they ever ask about, you're pretty much covered for Jeopardy purposes. It won't actually make you an expert on opera, but you don't need to be, you know? So yeah. Last night I was watching Jeopardy and there was a, a Shakespeare um, category member. They kept guessing the wrong play before the question. It was like the answer, um, what is Hamlet? No, that's wrong. The next, the next thing was, what is a Merchant of Venice? No, that was Hamlet. Um, okay, what is, the, and, and it went on like that. It was, yeah. pre it was pretty funny. <laughs> I enjoy Jeopardy except when they don't answer me correctly. <laughs> and there have been a few times, there must have been a writer there that, that liked me because I was, I've been a question and nobody else. Yeah, no, I do. Like having like, you know, gone through the archives of the show so much, you can definitely see at times that there's a writer that's really into like the author Henry James or something, and you just like all of a sudden just a ton of questions about Henry James for like a few seasons. And it's like And, oh, and Alec made sure there was a lot of Bible stuff in there. Mm. There was a lot of religious stuff. You yeah. are, are an atheist as as I yeah. am. Yeah. yeah, that is correct. And so is Ron Reagan Jr. <laughs> I, I saw it in a TV commercial. Not afraid of going to hell. <laughs> so, but but yeah, yeah, those those Bible questions always crack me up. Yeah, because it's like. But I also I I, I, I I'm an atheist now, but I had twelve years of Catholic school, so like. So did I. So yeah, it it helps. Firestein is just a name I adopted for <laughs> show business. <laughs> This audience is, I'm not sure. Um, it's New York City. You know. <laughs> Who is your favorite all-time Golden State Warriors player from Austin? <laughs> nice. Um, I, you know, I hate to just say Steph Curry, but the answer is Steph Curry. I mean, it is. Um, you know, I, I want to go, like, more hipster with it and just, like, when I first started become watching the team, I loved watching Andres Biedrich, but not because he was any good. Uh, he would just like, we would all just like sit in the stands every time he was up at the free throw line because he was like a 20% free throw shooter. And like every time he made one, like the crowd would go crazy because we were, we'd been losing for 30 years and these were like, the kinds of things we could celebrate. So I've, I have fond memories of him, uh, but, but the answer is Steph. So that was sports? Yes, yeah. I'm a drag queen. I don't know. <laughs> Ask me about cross dresses and I'll give you the answers. Is there a Jeopardy Masters Goats group chat? Um, do you share do you share memes, articles, recipes? <laughs> Alex wants to know. <laughs> Um, you know, there is, like, it's not, like, super active, um, but, like, it exists, yeah. There is. Yeah, yeah. You no, all I mean, know we're... each other off the show? <laughs> do you have uh, parties? Do you have, like, cocktail parties and stuff? <laughs> no, not, not that much. I mean, we, we live all over the country, but, I mean, it, we genuinely all really do, uh, you know, like, get along. We had such a good time just hanging out with each other, like, backstage at, at the Jeopardy Masters, and, you know, like, all, you know, and I, I had met all of them and played with most of them before, and so going into that, like, it was, it was a stressful time. The first uh, Jeopardy Masters taping was the same week as my final, we're going to take the advance back if you don't get this draft finished deadline for this book. So it was, like, a stressful time, but I was, I was very much looking forward to, to seeing all of them again. But it's, it's, it is an amazing thing. People think because you, you have played against each other mm -hmm. um, that, that somehow you're enemies. But you're the only people who have ever had that experience. Yeah. It's like being in a bus crash together. <laughs> you, you're the only ones who knew how it felt. You, know? you might have gotten a broken leg and they might have gotten away with nothing, but you're only, the only ones who know. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, that's sort of true. Um, <laughs> 
Yeah, somebody at the at the Tournament of Champions said that they had looked it up and that more people have been in outer space than have competed in the Jeopardy Tournament of Champions. You know, it's 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 a small group. And and and, and a small group. Um, this is from Elaine, like Seinfeld. <laughs> Does that mean Elaine likes Seinfeld or Elaine, you like Seinfeld? <laughs> okay. Is there a piece of advice, maybe in the form of a question, you'd give to someone looking to find themselves out? Or maybe, uh, uh, maybe to you younger, or to your, speaking to your younger self, is this is there something? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, the thing I've learned that is sort of obvious when you say it out loud, but... Uh, you are the only expert in the world on your own mind and your own self. Um, so people are going to tell you, especially if you happen to be trans, for example, people are going to tell you that they know better than you, like who you are and, and what, you, what your identity is and things like that. Uh, but how could they possibly know better than you? Um, so, so really trusting that, you know, when you, you know, what you think about yourself isn't wrong even when other people are telling you that it is. Like, just, you, you can be confident in that, like, for sure, because you're, you're the one that's in there. Told you about her heart. I think I know the answer to this one. What single piece of media, including books, was most influential in how you approach learning? That's from Evan. Um, that's interesting. I, I think, um, I don't know, and I mean, I guess like sort of what I would say is is uh, really like Wikipedia, um, if the, if that kind of counts, um, which I think is an amazing institution that like I do think people should should support because if it went away, it wouldn't like there's there, it, it wouldn't be recreated now if it didn't already exist. Um, but I think you know I love it because it it lets me like learn the way I like learning, which is just following things in whatever direction like I get interested in and taking it where it leads me. You know, I'm not I'm not great at studying per se, like studying a specific subject because I have to study that subject. I like exploring and, and Wikipedia is perfect for it. Yeah, and and please take that to heart. Um, Wikipedia and YouTube are two things that we take it, uh, for granted. They cost money to put on, and um, they give us so much. I mean, I know that it, when I'm sitting there in front of my sewing machine and I don't know how to do something, I go to YouTube, <laughs> and there is somebody there who says, it's okay, gotcha. <laughs> and the same with Wikipedia. Though sometimes you gotta go and correct shit. <laughs> I'm that married is... with three children. <laughs> All right, I think this may be our final question. This is from Mary Grace, but I think you'll know why I think it's our final question. How did you deal with the backlash from the internet trolls regarding being transgender? Um, you know, it, partly by just ignoring them as much as possible, um, you know, which was what I was advised to do. And it, it's, you know, it is not, it's easier said than done. Um, certainly, you know, I remember getting a, a message, you know, <clears throat> a message online from somebody saying some hateful things on Thanksgiving. And I was just like, how, how did you decide that this was how you were going to use some of your Thanksgiving day was to try to make a stranger feel bad? Um, but, you know, like, there's no... It doesn't do me any good to get angry at them. There's no way of me changing their minds. They're not there to have a debate. They're just there to, to bully so, you know, I just ignored them as best I could, and that was far easier than I expected because it was such a small percentage of, of what I was hearing from people. I thought it would be so much worse, and so, you know, that made it a lot easier to ignore the, the relative trickle of, of trolls that I had to, that I did come across. And, and they're not real. Yeah. They're just not real. They can say whatever they want. It doesn't matter. It doesn't mean anything to them. They can sit and make up stuff that, yeah, it's, I mean, they've they never put themselves where you've put yourself. Right. Yeah, and it's like you know, most people that say anything like that online, like they wouldn't actually say it in real life to a person's face. It's that that disconnect lets them, you know, like sets them free from that responsibility and understanding that there's a human on the other side of it. But when they actually encounter you as a human being, 
you know, some of them, sure, will still be that kind of an asshole, but most of them wouldn't, and so recognize that, like, online, online is not real life. And, and they would never put their own lives out the way that you have, and if they did, nobody would read the book. <laughs> well, I think we are old. I have one more minute. One more minute. Okay, one more minute. Um, thank you. Um, oh, from my friend Tree. A long story there. Um, <laughs> would you like a tour of the Stone Wall, where it all began? Uh, Tree was the bartender. <laughs> you know, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Tree, you got your answer. <laughs> but she's on tour now. First, you have to. Buy a lot of books at the Stonewall. Well, <laughs> I want to say what a, I, I hope I did you justice. That's oh, all I yeah. can say. But, but what a thrill it was for me to spend this time with you. I, mean, I do adore you. I do watch, I watch the show. Uh, they adore you. A thrill for me, too. Thank you. <laughs>